Andras here. When I'm not co-hosting the World is Wrong podcast, I'm hosting and producing the Radio 8 Ball podcast, where we answer questions by picking songs at random, like picking musical tarot cards. We've hosted musical divinations for people like John C. Riley, Patricia Arquette, Tig Notaro, and Fred Armisen, and hosted over 200 songwriters providing the randomly chosen answers from Inara George and Dan Byrne to Mose Allison and Alan Toussaint. That's Radio 8 Ball, all one word. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts and download our app from the iTunes App Store. I'm Stephen Paris, and you're listening to The World is Wrong Podcast. We're here to tell you how the world is wrong. The world is wrong about you. The Missouri Breaks! <laughs> Welcome to The World is Wrong, an extremely positive podcast where we celebrate films and film artists the world is wrong about. I am one of your hosts, and my name is Andras Jones. And I'm Brian Connolly, also a host. Of this show. But not, of this show. <laughs> not entirely for this show. No, I'm a liar. <laughs> no, this is... This is uh, this is our, uh, I don't know, like Purple Rose of Cairo show where we, we've we we've reached into the screen or the screen has reached into us <laughs> and we're doing an episode about the Missouri Breaks with Stephen Peros, who is the screenwriter of The Cat's Meow, your, uh, Brian, yeah. your chosen antidote to, to Mankness. Anyone out yeah. there afflicted with makeness, you suggest you prescribe the cat's meow to them. I, and, this is, yep. And uh, Stephen Peros wrote out, wrote back to us to say, hey, uh, thanks for covering my film. And we said, wow, thanks for reaching out to us. Can we put you to work? <laughs> and he said, yeah, he'd love to. He gave me a list of films that he thought the world was wrong about. Uh, and we decided yeah. to do the Missouri breaks. So but but Brian, what's yeah. your what's and your it, take on the break? What's your break take? <laughs> I saw this movie a while ago because there was a moment in time. Well, the, I, I've always been obsessed with Nicolas Cage, of course. And I was like, well, I want to watch more kind of like wild actors that take chances and do risks with their performances and try new things, whether it's a failure or not. I'm interested in that. So I sought out Brando because I always heard about his stuff. And this was sort of the first one I went to because I heard about him using the cute notoriously using the cue cards on on this movie nah. which you guys talk about yeah, later in yeah, this episode yeah. <laughs> and uh and that was very exciting to me i was like that is interesting and then reading his sort of idea of why he used the cue cards and how he wanted and later he used an earpiece i think in the score is that what the movie's called the frank oz movie mm -hmm. where he wanted to have the dialogue come to him as if he was a person thinking and the ideas would come to him immediately. So he thought cue cards would be a great way to be like, now these thoughts are in my head and I'm seeing it in front of me. And I'm now I'm going through these ideas in this dialogue. I mean, I think that's very interesting. So I watched it because of that. But then I got this much, even more exciting movie than just that. Like, I'm a big Thomas McGuane. Is that how you say it? Yeah. <laughs> McGuane. Mr. McGuane. <laughs> Because I, 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 I really like his books. I really like his other movies. And I just hadn't seen this one yet. And it just, yeah, it just got that great 70s version of the genre sort of movie, which I really like. So, like, taking the Western and doing a Western that's nothing like a Peck and Paw, and it's nothing like a Leone, and it's nothing like a John Ford. It's like this own weird Arthur Penn, McGowan, Brando, Nicholson, et cetera, thing. And so, and it's just, yeah, it's just one of those movies where it's just like every five minutes, a new great actor, actress is on the screen. And you're just like, oh, they're in this movie. Oh, this is so great. And uh, yeah, no, I just, I'm a fan. I'm a fan of Arthur Penn in general, uh, of most of his stuff. And yeah, it just was really exciting. And I think Peros is a great guest to have because I feel he's definitely, he feels like a member of the family, doesn't he? He feels like he is on the right side. Yeah, I feel of, like he goes through of life. Of movie <laughs> obsession. <laughs> Loving films Defending that these people, movies. Yeah, or is they bad things about. Yeah, and so he just very, like, I hope we can have him back because I think this episode is great. I think the interview is really exciting. 
And uh, yeah, no, I just, no, it was a delight to hear someone whose work I respected a lot be on this show and kind of add so much to what we've already made of just sort of appreciating. Because in this conversation, he's like us too, where he jumps around and talks about other movies too. Like this episode's about the Missouri Breaks, but he drops about another 12 movies that you're quickly writing down and be like, well, I need to see that too. Yeah. So that's the right kind of movie obsessive. Like he should have his own movie podcast or if I ever get fired or get overwhelmed with life and quit, <laughs> would you replace him with, you should replace me with him. So I think, he wears glasses. Like we're probably about the same height. He looks like he's five nine. Why are you trying to I get out of totally... this show? Why? <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. I'm just saying. He is. I think he is great. So I'm very happy that he is on here. And uh, yeah, no. And this is this episode is a true delight. Even if you haven't seen this movie, and you should, just hearing him talk about hearing film obsessive talk about movies is exciting to me always. That's why you spent over a decade in a video store behind the exactly, de- and I bet and the counter, yeah. <laughs> and I would have hired uh, him to work there yeah. if he had ever come in. If he ever was like, "I'm a failed screenwriter, it didn't work out. Can I get paid seven dollars an hour to work at your video store? I love movies." I'd be like, "Hired." Luckily, so. if you if you checked out our Cats <laughs> Meow episode, he actually did pretty well, but with the Cats Meow, and is still yeah. still doing pretty well. So yeah. Yeah, so he will yes. never have to do that job, but I'm sure it will warm Nobody. his cockles to know <laughs> that he could have. And and we're, we're gonna go, so we're gonna go to a clip now of, from the film. But one thing I just wanted to say about the the Brando thing, you know, you, you what what I always wonder when you talk when people talk about him having the earpiece, I got it. What I really wonder is who is the actor that he gets to be the voice in his yeah. mind because if you're brando you it's you're you're gonna pick someone very particular for that like i'd like to see a movie about the person <laughs> oh that is a great <laughs> idea gilbert godfrey as the earpiece for marlon brando <laughs> and you do it like you do it like dead men don't wear plaid where you're actually cutting to brando in these scenes <laughs> Uh, this is a great idea, and, and same with the cue card guy. Like, let's make this movie. Let's just the people that are helping Brando's performances that we never see. Yeah. Let's have. <laughs> I like the idea of you make it the same person his whole life, and you make this movie about this this person who's always been like the cue card holder or guy reading the thing, and having to hang out with Marlon Brando. I think that's a wonderful. <laughs> you know who it is? I bet it's movie. I bet it's the actor who played Little Devil. In oh the yeah <laughs> doing the baby voice yeah, yeah. probably <laughs> yeah anyway uh. <laughs> let's let's get to uh the missouri breaks with stephen peros and uh hope you dig it hey tom tom huh? <laughs> you're the only ranch around here who hasn't met the new regulator tom logan robert e lee clayton it's a pleasure to make your acquaintance sir <sighs> Damn near sucked my boot off. Pleasure to meet you. Regulator. Ain't that like a dry gulcher? Well, that's not the softest term you could use, I'd say. Well, a regulator. Correct me now if I'm wrong. Isn't a regulator one of these boys that shoots people and don't never get near them? That's it. Well, uh... What about the binoculars? What are they for? Well, I've taken to watching funny-looking birds. I see. Well, hell, I don't know. I suppose if you didn't get away off a mile or so to do the job, you'd just get messy like I done here. Easy, Tom. Don't let me down. I've just had to hear this from all the other dreamers trying to ranch around here. Lead you ever... Hit a man from a mile off while he was carrying a pail of water. A mile? Well, but I don't remember the pail. No, sir. When you hang a man, usually he has a chance to talk or say goodbye, write a letter. Besides, a Creedmoor. It's a Creedmoor, isn't it? It is a Creedmoor, sir, and a beautiful one. 
Must make a pretty good mess of a human. Well, you hit a guy from 500 yards out, say, why, the suddenness of it, he don't even have a few seconds to make his act of contrition. Not only that, but you never have to look him in the eye. Right there, that makes all the difference. I would disagree with you, sir. The thing that makes all the difference in the world, I believe, is the fact that it accomplishes the task, you see. This old boy in Wyoming. This old boy in Wyoming, he sat down on the ground just to pull sand burrs out of his trousers and his skull just suddenly flew into pieces about the size of your thumbnail. That was the first time I ever heard the term. Regulator. It was the first time. First time. Is the Missouri Breaks from 1975 the most 70s Western? In it, we have Jack Nicholson, the great star of the 1970s, with Marlon Brando coming off the twin creative and critical successes of The Godfather and Last Tango in Paris. Directed by Arthur Penn, who, with Warren Beatty, inaugurated New Hollywood with Bonnie and Clyde, after directing one of the first Brando flops, The Chase, and was himself coming off one of his less heralded career highlights, Night Moves with Gene Hackman. Nicholson's gang of outlaws is made up of 70s stalwarts Harry Dean Stanton, Frederick Forrest, John P. Ryan, and Randy Quaid, and at the heart of the film is a very sex-positive relationship between Nicholson's cattle rustler and Kathleen Lloyd as the evil cattle baron's daughter, who was way more of a 1970s woman than an 1870s woman. The script is by author Thomas McGuain, who wrote the novel, and the music is by John Williams in between Jaws, 1975, and Star Wars, 1977. While The Missouri Breaks was in production, McGuain was directing 92 in the Shade with Peter Fonda, Warren Oates, and Margot Kidder, which was produced by Elliot Kastner, who also produced The Missouri Breaks, and this very same year, Frank Peary's Rancho Deluxe, also written by McGuain, another very 1970s western. The plot of The Missouri Breaks? It's about cattle rustlers and a regulator brought in to hunt them down. But there is a lot more going on. Brando was coming off something you can't top. Sure, he rejected his Best Actor Oscar for The Godfather, but he accepted the renewed attention and he brought everything he had to the role of regulator Robert E. Lee Clayton, a charismatic trickster dandy who hunts men for sport the way men hunt, quote, beasts, unquote. His improvisations on the set are a subject of much historical gossip, but whatever he and Penn settled on is an encapsulation of many layers of white devilry. Nicholson, on the other hand, coming off his first Oscar win for One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, is shaggy and unruly, doing his own hippie take on Brando's Wild One. A deeply emotional man cast as an outlaw, but a natural farmer and lover whose every scene, not just those with Brando, gets elevated as he slow plays the whole movie. Mastery across the board is what we have at work in this production. At least, that's how I see it. But let's go now to our guest, Stephen Peros, and find out how the world is wrong about this film. Welcome to The World is Wrong, and can you tell us how the world is wrong about the Missouri Breaks? Uh, there's, I can't even begin to, well, like a lot of films where, where the world is wrong, we realize that they were, um, they were judged in their times um, by, uh, 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 against their times and against um, uh prejudices against cast members directors or maybe a glut in the market of a certain genre and it takes us the distance 
to or a new audience to just view the film on its own terms. You know, one of the, the films types of films I was talking to you about at one point is the um, the Burton Taylor, Elizabeth, Richard Burton, Elizabeth Taylor uh, oeuvre and how there was they were so ubiquitous that people got sick of them and the critics were always ready to tear down their films, whether they made justifiably bad films or whether they made good films like the, the, the comedians. They couldn't quite tear down Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. Um, but, but there are films of theirs that are actually pretty solid that were just, um, because the critics were just, or oh, 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 they were just, they were just tied to Liz and Dick. And, um, and they, and, and Burton in particular was making a lot of movies. Uh, and so it was, you know, they, they would, they would tear these down. So you find with a little bit of dis Ishtar is another good one, good example of a film with some distance. Mm -hmm. It was a film that was al already had, um, forget about two strikes bottom of the ninth, had three strikes when it came out. And all every review was about how much press had gone on about troubled production, uh, um, um, cr uh, insane budget for just a, what, what is just a light comedy. And, and even the critics led with that in their reviews as if there's some sort of arbiters of finance. Uh, doesn't matter. That's not their job. Uh, and you watch the film and you realize, oh, this is this is kind of a fun little movie. Uh, so this, So similarly here, I think, um, you know, we can talk in broad strokes and then get into details. I think um, one of the things, because I discovered this film late and my jaw was I'm going, oh, my God. There, and in my mind, I probably was saying some form of the, ter the phrase, the world is wrong. In my head, when I was watching this film for the first time about two years ago, uh, Brent, this isn't an out of control silly performance by Brando. It's a very controlled performance by Brando. There's very specific choices or very specific reasons about and and uh, about that. It was also, uh, there was a glut on the market of quirky Westerns, you know, 70s spin on the American Western. And I think the critics had kind of, were kind of done with it. You know, this is 76. Uh, so we're, you know, we're past Jaws. Um, uh, the market is kind of this is sort of not really the right film anymore <laughs> for for the marketplace. Uh, so I think there's just a lot of reasons why um, why they're wrong. And it always it's and again, there was a lot of reports of it. But there was a lot of troubled set reports that were coming out. I think Brando and or Nicholson both gave interviews during from the set where they leaked that kind of information, you know, expressed some sort of frustration with the process or the process of their fellow actor. Uh, but that all aside, the film is all that matters. And the film holds up. And again, we can go into detail about that without without monologue <laughs> from oh, me. Boy, does it ever. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it, it definitely holds up. It's It shines mm -hmm. through. Yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, so, and I, I hear exactly what you're saying about yeah it it's it seems to have been judged harshly by its time and then just that then those stories just get repeated and repeated and repeated and mm -hmm. uh we'll get into it but as you know in doing my research it seems like there's also just a lot people have such strong feelings about brando and nicholson mm -hmm. that people there's just a lot of projection in terms of yes. what people yes read into their performances and what's lacking based upon what we want to see there as opposed to the amazing work. I feel like they're both doing amazing work. And, you know, everyone gushes about the scenes with Pacino and De Niro in Heat. I feel right. like the scenes with Brando and Nicholson have exactly that same kind of quality of like, oh, yeah, everything, everything you want from two great actors is happening here. Oh yeah, I mean, and you see this, you know, and, and it, it, you know, it all begins with Vincent Canby in in the New York Times, you know, out of control performance given by Brando. Um, uh, nothing he does has any apparent connection to the movie that surrounds him. He grabs our attention but does nothing with it, uh, and then then he says it's, it just seems like all the other actors are, uh, including you know, he, he says it just seems like Nick Nicholson is. Um, uh, just trying to uh, trade oddities and barbs with with um, with Brando, and it's 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 untrue. I mean, Brando's character has to be dangerous. We have to and and unpredictable. 
He's someone whose job is to kill you uh, and, and, and often from afar, but possibly up close. Um, we have to fear him. We have to feel that in this beautiful pastoral gorgeousness of a visual of the West, that there's always that there are these dangers and that and this guy is a loner. This guy is a sociopath. Um, this guy is t uh, his lifestyle makes him he, he totally disconnected from other human beings. Um, and he has decided to delight in that surrender um, um, to that, the monster from the id in him. And so it makes total sense that you never know where that that he is playing around as a human being with accents. You don't know where he's from. He's Irish. Then he's southern. Um, he doesn't want you to know him. Uh, it's it's it makes total sense. The more I watch that performance, it's certainly not lazy. It's certainly not phoned in. I don't care that he had that he had uh, that Brando had uh, cue cards all over the set. It's not apparent when you watch the film. Yeah. All I care is what's on that screen. So none of that matters to me. I watch the movie. I don't see a guy going up on his lines or not figuring it out. I don't see any of his moments or scenes or monologues not connected to the material. Uh, I know Penn and, and Nicholson expressed displeasure. And that sticks with these people because of the experience. You know, a great film I like to point out, another film that's perfect for, for your show, is Two Weeks in Another Town, which was the follow-up um, several years later that Manelli and Lancaster and producer John Hausman uh, all did uh, after they um, had done the, the, the band The Beautiful. Um, Bad and the Beautiful, a huge critical hit, huge box office success, black and white, Academy ratio, Academy standard ratio. And now they come together and they do this cinemascope, garish color film about a, a movie about a film crew in the American film crew in Italy. Um, and it's a film just like Missouri Breaks that has been reevaluated and, and now people realize is a great film. In its time, it was trashed as, oh, a gaudy, tacky follow-up, you know, to the far superior Bad and the Beautiful. You look at the autobiographies of Manelli, of Edward G. Robinson, of Kirk Douglas, they all dismiss the film. They all dismiss it. Oh, well, I guess we failed. Oh, well, I guess we failed. I'm hoping that Kirk Douglas, who obviously uh, lived longer than all of them, somewhere in his last 10 or 15 years of his life, he's noticed that people actually now embrace the film and, and think it's a, a terrific film. But, you know, they get the, the filmmakers get trapped, too, into the experience of making it. And the they know it's not there. They know what they wanted. You know, Thomas McGuane uh, di didn't like it because of how much Brando changed. You know, Stephen King doesn't like The Shining because of how much Kubrick changed. Yet King's own TV movie version of The Shining is terrible, maybe very loyal to the source material but it's not a good movie it's certainly not a better movie <laughs> than kubrick's you know you, the, the personal experience of making cinema makes the people who made it the least reliable uh, judges of what is their best film what is their worst film i remember as a kid seeing a movie called the competition with richard dreyfus and amy irvin mm. and i was a, kid, a teenager and i remember think really loving it and thinking you know i'm being exposed to what romantic relationships are and i th remember thinking dreyfus was really really good now, I think uh, two years later, I see some interview with Dreyfus after he dries out or something. And I, I had no idea whatever he was, a cocaine addict, whatever he was. And he said, yeah, I did a bunch of a bunch of movies that I don't even remember. And I gave shitty performances. And I think he singled out the competition as a movie he, he gave a, a, a crappy performance in. So is that supposed to change my opinion of his performance? Because the actor just said he gave a crappy performance. You know, it doesn't work that way. I've, I've directed theater where I've watched an actor be extraordinary that night and they come off stage going, oh, I'm yeah. sorry, I'm so bad. And that same actor on another night, and this, I'm, I'm not even just making this up to prove a point, this actually happened to me. Another actor, I'm watching the actor really not good. And he comes off stage pumped and amped about how I, I was there. I was totally there. Oh, was my yeah. And I'm like, you, you couldn't have been more disconnected from the audience perspective of what you were doing. You may have been in your head, and having an incredible performance, but it was just in your head. So, you know, the artists are not the most, because I've seen people do that to me, you know, I'll like a film and I'm on some Facebook film group and they'll point out, they'll try to prove I'm in, incorrect because they'll say the actor didn't think he was good. Or it's the director's least favorite of his films. Like that does not matter to me. <laughs> As an actor myself, I can tell you that uh, my experience is if I enjoyed it, 
it probably wasn't good. <laughs> no one ever writes movies about characters who are enjoying themselves. Right. Yes. Well, so, we got to have conflict, you know, I mean, conflict as Hitchcock said, movies are life with the boring parts cut out. Yeah. And, uh, and we need conflict and we need characters in crisis. Otherwise we're watching somebody's iPhone video of how cute their baby is. And we're like, well, this is all very entertaining for you, but it really sucks for me to watch it. Um, you know, we need some, now if you show me your kid trip, I'll watch, you know, <laughs> <laughs> well, let's let's dig into the the creators on this. So, mm -hmm. uh, in researching this, I put together the Thomas McGuane connection, and he was having quite a little run right there in that mm -hmm. period. He got he gets three movies made: ninety two in the shade, which is a sort of a, a cult classic, which he directed, mm -hmm. and then Rancho Deluxe, which is also kind of a cult classic. Mm -hmm. And then this, which I guess in it, in, in it also, so it's three films get made very quickly. None of them succeed in the marketplace and all three have had really, I feel like stronger lives after the release than at the time. Do you have any relationship with Thomas McGuane as a writer or just in general as a filmmaker? Well, just the, the films. I mean, to me, this is a perfect example of um, the collaborative uh, uh, nature of film. This is a this is a great example of uh, a producer, Elliot Kastner, who is ju just um, the, the kind of you know I don't know anything about him personally, but he's just the kind of producer you just want to hang with. He's the kind of guy who says, "Oh, I understand that." You know, right now we use the word producer. Sadly, somebody who hustled together some money and they get a producer some of the money for a film, they get a producer credit. Oh, they're Tom Cruise's manager, they get a producer's credit. No, he's the guy who does what you're supposed to do, um, which is I'm going to find some material and I'm going to start growing it from the material. And so, you know, having come from an agency background, you know, he knew it all started, you know, as, as Robert Evans says in his his book, you know, it all started with, with the property. And so he would, you know, get the property. He, was, he would identify, he would find the writers of note, the properties of note. And he, you know, he pushed you know, McGuane, uh, 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 to deliver this. And then he played that great game with, which, with, with, which is whispering in Brando's ear, I got Nicholson and whispering in Nicholson's ear, I got Brando and getting them to agree to do the movie when neither of them had actually had said yes first, but they said yes, because the other one was on board. A pretty ballsy uh, move considering their yeah. neighbors. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Well, you know, but I was reading, um, uh, Patrick McGilligan's uh, Jack's Life is a, 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 a pretty formidable biography. And he, they were not yet friendly. I don't know if the house purchase had happened prior to um, uh, or not, uh, but they were not yet friendly um, at that point, uh, whether, whether they weren't actually neighbors yet, uh, but they didn't really have uh, a personal relationship it was, um, at that uh, before going into the film. Uh, but, you know, the film did, you know, Nicholson, you know, um, he was incredibly busy. I mean, you look at his bio, you know, uh, uh, he was he was doing three and four, you know, two to two to four films a year once Easy Rider hit. Um, and he hadn't really done a romantic part. You can't really say Chinatown was a, it, it was mm -hmm. it's a film noirish romance, you know. Um, uh, so these are some of his some of his first romantic scenes so he was not particularly um, connecting with kathleen lloyd uh in the film he's that there's someone i feel bad for here's someone who this which why you never you never can assume you're there at any point in your career uh you've made it uh because you know here is kathleen lloyd who has a, a history in television they realize they don't, they're not they don't need to cast a star we got two stars we don't have to find a star woman to play this part let's just get a solid actress you know, now I'm suddenly making my big screen debut after having, doing tons of television, introducing Kathleen Lloyd, and I'm opposite not just Jack Nicholson, the hottest actor, but Marlon Brando, the legendary actor. And I have scenes with both of them. And it did nothing for her career. She did one more theatrical, which is The Car with James Brolin, which is a fun cult, cult favorite. I think yeah. it's actually a, a genuinely good film, genuinely well-made film, um, uh, and fairly deep, uh, I actually believe. Uh, but then she went right back to television. and. And no one really knows her name. In fact, Susan Sarandon, 
who wanted this part in the Missouri breaks, I think was quoted somewhere in interviews years later saying, uh, you know, that I really, you know, I remember auditioning for the Missouri breaks. I really wanted the part. And they gave it to some actress who I don't even remember her name. I think that's literally her petty, her petty quote. That's too bad. It. She's, cause she's great. And I think she, yeah. I think her scenes, her scenes with Nicholson particularly are great. I think she's great all the way through it. I feel, feel like she's an incredibly yeah. grounding presence that's the word, the i film. swear to you that's the word that was in my my brain as you were talking grounding and grounded and she looks you in the eye she's very very simple very and it's actually very different she's very flamboyant and big and sassy in the car um and yet she's very stately uh she's very she's kind of pre-feminist uh on her way to feminism um so she's very straight um she's not she's not uptight or anything a prissy but she's but she uh, um she also understands the physicality of being, you know, a woman in this period in the West. Uh, so, yeah, I think she's really, really solid in the film. I don't quite know why in, in the biography Nicholson apparently was quoted as saying, you know, I couldn't re basically I couldn't really get it up for her, more or less. Well, according but, I just listened to an interview with Thomas McGuane and mm -hmm. he says that basically Nicholson tried to. It was expecting to sort of get some mojo going with her. And then she showed up with her girlfriend. And <laughs> it's funny after what, like, I, I love their, I love their scenes. I feel like their scenes are some great seventies mm -hmm. male, female relating like the, the mm -hmm. dance of, I don't know. Seduction is the wrong word. Uh, the dance of their coupling is very, feels very 70s and feels very as you said very modern but also in its time um but then re-watching it is like oh i guess I th that's me i grew up mm -hmm. in olympia and i just have you know like i had a thing for kate jackson when i was she was my right. charlie's <laughs> angel it's like oh i guess i have a type <laughs> but yeah, that's funny. but i love yeah I, I really love their interactions and maybe that explains some of nicholson's difficulties but it's Whatever it was, if he was having difficulty connecting with her, it doesn't come across on the film. Uh, no, and they, they had a, you um, know, the, the 70s are filled with having, you know, one great editor. This, you know, this this film had a, had a few uh, solid editors on it. So they did, you know, a Homeric job of, of, um, of uh, any, any things that were, I mean, that, that, that relationship um, reads on screen. Um, you don't, you don't get a sense, like I said, you don't get a sense that Brando is looking at cue cards, you know, everything there, I think, you know, I think hats off to the, uh, to the team of, of, of Dee Dee Allen and, and Jerry Greenberg and Steven Rotter for, for cutting, I mean, Dee Dee Allen is, you know, legendary. Um, so I think there's, uh, I think their performance works at Nicholson. One of the things I, you know, really, the more you read about Nicholson, you realize as much as his public persona is this casual guy, easygoing guy, Jack, you know, um, he's serious on set. He's serious in his prep. Um, he's serious in wanting to make sure he's delivering the character, um, particularly at that period. And he already knew then that he was being known for that smile. And so he made sure he he wanted... He wanted to downplay it, downplay Jack, modern contemporary Jack Nicholson coming through. He had his teeth. He wanted his teeth yellowed from from nicotine and from lack of brushing. So he had them. They were yellowed the whole shoot. You know, one of the th things that um, Arthur Penn talks about is how what people don't realize how natural Jack comes to the Western. Um, he did a lot of Westerns. He wrote Westerns. You know, Monty Hellman, who we just mm -hmm. lost, who I, knew, who I knew he was just a wonderful wonderful man and 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 nicholson you forget having not seen missouri breaks and only knowing so many of nicholson's other films he's great on a horse uh he knows what he's doing uh they would talk about where's jack where's jack and 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 you would often confuse him from the other ranchers and cattle hands and people who they had on as extras he was not a movie star when he was making this movie he was i mean he was a movie star but he was not behaving as one mm -hmm. and he felt Seemed very much at home in these locations, in these sets, in this clothing. You know, the costume designer talks about um, working with him and picking out how serious he was, not about how good he looked, but uh, what about making sure it was right for the character. You know, the little bandana around his head and, and every, you know, all mm -hmm. of that. This is, not, this is not a vain actor, you know, um, and I think that's why 
he misinterpreted and got frustrated by what he saw as possibly Brando's disrespect for the process, when in the end there's nothing disrespectful at all. He delivered exactly, thank God, what the, the movie needed. Mm -hmm. um, and, and a completely unique a portrayal. Because, um, you know, you make an American Western, you're, you're, you're standing on the shoulders of history of the American Western. And how, okay, now I'm the... I'm the guy who's here to kill the the lead. You know, we've seen that character. Um, the the bad guy who's ridden into town to kill the lead, and we have to fear him. Uh, and it's Lee Van Cleef or whoever it is. Um, how do I make this one stand out and have a reason for existing? And whether Brando could articulate it that way or not, it's certainly what he did every time he did a role. You know, you look at him in the, in the formula without with with George C. Scott, and they mm -hmm. talk about how difficult it was, and how he had made a lot of crazy demands, and he has an he has an ear, you know, and a, a, a he has a thing in his ear that's that that for the character it's it's supposed to be a hearing aid, but it was so that they could feed him his lines. I'm sorry, he's actually the most interesting thing in the movie when you watch it. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's, it's the best thing. In the movie. He may have frustrated the hell out of John Avildsen and George C. Scott. But thank God he's in the movie. I say the same thing about Island of Dr. Moreau. People just talk about a loopy, crazy, uh, totally off the rails performance by Marlon Brando. That movie actually gets better on repeated viewings, and especially because you you can't take your eyes off Brando. And it's a real character. And it's an extension of Kurtz in Apocalypse Now, in a way, of what he did, the work he did on that character. Um, and in a way, he, he because he himself, the more he grew as a person, became this man, this island unto himself, you know, in his own way, like like Michael Jackson or something. You know, you get into this world of it's just you and you're told by everyone around you, the world is just you and we're all just revolving around you. You start to believe it and living that way. Um, and I think um, and I think that's I think that starts in with this performance with Missouri Breaks, uh, but totally in sync with the material. I think he had a lot more respect for, for for the essence of material than people give him credit for. He may have not had the respect for the letter of the word of the dialogue, but I think it was always, you feel like, look, you're hiring me. This is how I work. Mm -hmm. If you didn't want to hire me, hire somebody else. This is how I'm going to give you my best. Um, you know, I think he did. One of the things that I think about when I watch Brando's performance in this is just how many layers of white devilry he is bringing to it. it this is right in the midst of his very strong connection with the American Indian movement. Yep. And it's why he said no at first. He didn't want to do a Western um, because he just felt implicit in the American Western is is this. um Right. Take out of the Native American or vilifying of the of the Native American or making them the other uh, or not three dimensional. I mean, you can see like there's Custer is in is encoded in here when he's bird watching. He's got a German book. He's mm -hmm. like there's just all these diff all those weird choices. Mm -hmm. Like he, he's he talks like an Irish cop. Yeah. <laughs> with it, you know, there's just all these yeah. choices that he's making that are just hammering home the whiteness of it and mm -hmm. how and then that is contrasted with in every way. And this is goes to Arthur Penn's excellence. We haven't gotten to him yet, but yeah. the way he makes Nicholson such a mess, like a very mm -hmm. attractive mess, yeah. uh, which is also in keeping with the time. He feels much more like a grounded back to the land hippie and Brando seems like, you know, just like a white devil. And yep. they do like in every scene, whether it's what they're wearing on their heads or how messy they are or the way they talk. It's, it's one of the things that I really, really love. Uh, I've loved upon repeat viewings of this film is how many different ways they juxtapose these two characters. And for Brando, it's all about finery and civilization. Mm -hmm. And that gives him so much room to act. And that also makes Nicholson's job so much easier, which I, mm -hmm. I'm surprised that Nicholson has a problem with it because I feel like basically Brando steals every scene, but in doing so, he allows Nicholson to walk off with the movie, mm -hmm. which is yeah. what you want I mean from this. The a part of Brando's deal was that all of his stuff had to be shot first, and uh, and then 
So everything you see that doesn't have Brando was shot at long after, you know, he he and Brando have their final scene. Um, but Brando stuck around and and he was on set the whole time. So Nicholson, you know, is trying to make heads or tails out of out of all the footage they shot of Brando, not knowing how it's going to come together, not knowing how it's going to cut together uh, or, or how it's going to juxtapose against what he's doing. So, you know, there's a bit of uh, insecurity, I'm sure, that. Um, that came into play as he was, you know, continuing to make the movie. There are, um, you know, but there's a lot Brando brought to it besides all, you know, the voices and the coming into town, you know, uh, hanging on the side of a horse so you couldn't see him. Get all of it, I think, with with great uh, um, uh, purpose. You know, he also invented uh, that weapon that he uses. Uh, what the, the that he uses that to kill the rabbit and to, and, and also uh, Harry Dean it, Stanton. Harry Dean Stanton. Um, that he came up with that, or he researched and found it. He just didn't want to be the guy. Everything is a gun, a gun, a gun. And that that moment when he that that sudden violence mm-hmm. um, with Harry Dean Stanton is incredibly powerful. He gave Arthur Penn and the movie a gift, and he knew he was doing that. You know, there's they talk about you know the the the. The genius of Brando can't, can't uh, is not overrated. Um, uh, it is it is an accurate statement. Are there are there some films he's better in than others? Of course. Uh, there's some films he was on the mark more than others. Yes, but and, and do I want the world to be filled with Brandos? No. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't want every actor to be going off script. And I'm sure I'd be just as frustrated as Thomas McGuane if if he did nothing that was in the text uh, of the Cat's Meow because like all I can remember is being on set and trying to figure out what the hell are we doing. And our blood pressure going up. So I'm I'm sure it was difficult. Um, uh, but you were talking about McGuane, Just to sidetrack, one of the things uh, I learned uh, in in taking a look at this uh, biography of Nicholson is that the whole um, end sequence of him going back to the house and the whole bit, the business with the um, the father, and he seems to have had a stroke. Mm-hmm. But then it turns out there's a shootout. That was not in McGuane's script at all. And uh, because because the the it was the the big showdown was supposed to be Nicholson and and Brando's character, mm-hmm. and obviously they do this brilliant brilliant and powerful moment that puts closure on that. For those who haven't seen it, uh, I, I, it's just the, the the surprise of it is is incredibly powerful, um, both editorially and how it's shot in extreme close ups. But so the film needed that big ending and there were still, you know, things to resolve in the movie. So that is the um, that scene sequence is the uncredited Robert Town um, writing that uh, you'll see. Uh, um, he's not he's not on the on oh. the film credits, but he's on IMDb in various places as uncredited. He was brought in for that ending and McGuane doesn't like it. Um, largely, I'm sure, because. He didn't write it, and and they take it like a lot of writers. They tamper with my work. What is that doing there? Uh, so that whole sequence at the end was not part of the end of the movie. It was not the that's, way the movie was. That's shooting. funny because when watching it, it does feel tacked on. It feels kind mm-hmm. of tacked on. It feels like with the move, my interest in the movie definitely dips after yeah. <laughs> the Brando yeah. Nicholson showdown, and the rest yeah. of it feels like, yeah. oh, this is kind of. This is that sort of nice, it kind of has this nice little 70s, like, okay, we're just going to mm-hmm. hang out here a little bit longer right? and let it have this ending. But mm-hmm. really, I mean, it's, I'm glad, again, I'm not, I'm not one of those people who's like, oh, the movie's too long. I like long movies. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like extra stuff, but yeah. that makes a lot of sense because yeah. it, it, it's sort of like, what's this doing here? You know, so. Mm-hmm. Um, well, you know, but Arthur Penn was always a master of, understanding what rhythms of storytelling, you know, that go back to Arist- Aristotle's poetics, what, 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 what's hardwired into our DNA to expect to come next, to expect the rhythms of this scene or this moment to be. And now how can I use that against my audience to shock them, surprise them, make the left turn instead of the right turn. And, uh, and, and the, the, the showdown that the, the final bit between Nicholson and uh, Brando is just, two shots intercut um it's not what we expect and it's incredibly satisfying as a result um i just think it's 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 really genius in terms of how it's done because in a way that whole third act is the confrontation you know you know what brando is doing to draw out nicholson by going one by one through his people 
is in a sense, even though Nicholson's not in the scenes, it feels like all part of the final confrontation. Oh yeah. Uh, so, uh, and, and if you're going to do a, 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 if you're going to do a, a final takedown the way they do it in that film, you know, God, that line of Nicholson's is great. <laughs> Brett, it's just so, it's so well done. It's just so well. And I, I'm being cagey about it just in case there are people who are listening who want to check the film out. I wouldn't want to spoil that moment for them. Uh, but it's a, it's a, it's a terrific film. I mean, I'm, and I'm happy to segue to uh, Arthur Penn. Yeah, let's talk a little He's, bit about Arthur Penn. Who, He's a director. People who know that I'm a, uh, who have listened to a lot of the podcast, know I'm a huge fan of Warren Beatty and that I credit Warren Beatty with authorship of all of the films that he produced. Mm -hmm. But I do that with that, like, I don't do that in a way to take away credit from the directors he worked with, like mm -hmm. Arthur Penn or Hal Ashby. I feel like, in a way, that's part of his genius as a filmmaker is to cast. Mm -hmm directors and then sort of along what you were, what you said in our interview with Katz Meow about Peter Bogdanovich to cajole and get the best out of his directors the way a director does to actors. Yep, yep. Uh, but mm -hmm. uh, but we don't need to go down that road. I just my, my point is just to say uh, people might get the idea that I am dismissive of Arthur Penn's uh, talent as a director and I am anything but and this film has there's one moment in this film that is one of my favorite sort of method directing moments or <laughs> sort of honest directing moments in the in the first scene with Nicholson and Brando it also has the father uh who who brings them together and in the middle of their first interaction one of the horses whinnies or gives a little snort yeah. yes. and it interrupts their these two great method actors in a way that is <laughs> like Oh, that's so perfect. He let the yep. horse have a moment is mm -hmm. as a method director. Yeah, uh, he didn't pull cut and he left that take in. He used that take. And that's 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 real that's yeah. real uh that's that that's that's a great eye. And that's understanding that um uh here's I mean here's another quote Peter said to me about Wells. He says, you know, the problem with movies is that they come in cans and we can't let the films feel canned. And so you always have to do all of your prep. But you have to have your eye open for happy accidents. Mm -hmm. You have to let your you, you have to be aware of things that are going to happen um, because of circumstances, because of, uh, of 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 literally accidents like that moment. And and don't run away from them because they weren't part of the plan. Don't call cut because the horse whinnied. And to have actors because I've been on sets mm -hmm. and a plane goes overhead and the actor and an actor's oh cut, you know. It's like sometimes you just you know it's it's kind of the, the these are seasoned actors who know you keep going if the director didn't call a cut you're you're in character no matter what just came what mm -hmm. just happened uh, and that is that's a moment that really did leap out at me um, but you know he 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 like a lot of like Fr John Frankenheimer and Richard Donner and a lot of these guys he um, uh, Arthur Hiller he cut his teeth in in television live television that was his his training ground. Um, so that when he, you know, started directing at, you know, roughly age 40 for features, he, he knew his stuff. He was not insecure. He knew his stuff. Uh, he could even take the slings and arrows that he got from the chase, which I think is a terrific film and holds mm -hmm. up as the years go on, you know, even though it, did, it got a bit of a physical drubbing, um, is a solid film. And he, and he kept, kept true to what he was doing on that film, the kind of always a little bit anarchic, a little bit, little bit off what you expect um when he when he moved from the chase into bonnie and clyde a year later and kind of solidified yes i do know what i'm doing folks um little big man has always been a huge favorite of mine mm -hmm. and the film he did immediately preceding this oh yeah i think it's one of moves. the great films of the 1970s yeah um, is night moves one of the great unheralded truly great films of the 1970s oh yes um, so it's it's uh i mean that performance of hackman's the script uh, again, editorially, I think it's Dee Dee Allen again uh, on that. Um, it's just a brilliant movie. It's a it's a film that stays with you. It's 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 a it's a great addition to the private eye genre. It stands on its own, but it's very much of its period. Um, solid film. But after this and the and the failure of the Missouri Breaks fi uh, financially, and also just the direction cinema was going, and American cinema was going. You know, Star Wars a year later. Um, you know, films like Four Friends, which I haven't seen maybe since 81, since I was uh, a teenager, 
And I remember liking on HBO or something. Uh, I have I would like to revisit Four Friends because I remember there being uh, some some power in that film. But after that, everything he did after that were very un Arthur Penn movies. Uh, Target Dead of Winter and his what was his final theatrical anyway, which was Penn and Teller Get Killed. Um, I and I can't and I and I remember not decidedly not liking Dead of Winter. I just remember that being. Um, uh, not a thriller that um, I thought added up. Uh, again, I've seen it since it came out. I was probably disappointed because I already liked Arthur Penn. And I remember thinking, and I'm sure it was a, a script issue more than anything. Uh, if, if thrillers like that, if they don't, if I, if I get lost, if I, if my suspension of disbelief um, is, is challenged, I, it's hard for me to get back into the movie once it's lost me. Uh, so a film like that, you know, just, uh, I'm reminded of a, I think around that time, all these seventies directors, John Schlesinger did one with Michael Keaton and Melanie Griffith. I think what that was, that was a thriller around the same time, but I was like, okay, all these guys think the only way we're going to stay in the game is we were offered thrillers. Pacific uh, Heights. Is that it? Yeah. Pacific Heights. I, I was up like, for that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, were you? Yeah. No, I didn't get it, but that's fine. <laughs> I just remember that one was, again, the script. I just didn't believe half of the behavior, actions of half the characters. And so I just got lost. So they're not like they're not the films I want to remember Schlesinger or Arthur Penn for. Um, and this is a total digression. We can get back mm -hmm. to the Missouri Breaks. But I'm just kind of, I'm, as I went through Arthur Penn's filmography. So he ends up as an executive producer for one year in the middle of the run of Law and Order. <laughs> That's right. How does that happen? It feels like executive producer is the kind of thing where you're either in on the ground floor. That's or... interesting. Yeah, I, I don't know. And it's, it's not because he came on writing. I would have my gut again. This is just spitballing. Is that which season did you say it was? 2000, 2001. Which is how, how like far? 10 years the... in. OK, I have a feeling that probably somebody high up at, at on the show was a gigantic Arthur Penn fan. Mm hmm. So saw that he could use that they could give back and brought him on kind of to to not quite show run but but maybe help steer or guide or talk about the scripts and gave him that gig um that's that's feels like what 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 that would be again i'm just i'm just spitballing especially if, if he's if he's not on as a writer or director on any of those episodes you know i think it, that would happen a lot of times these directors would be like it happened with, I think, Billy Wilder towards the end of his career. This, some of the, the you know filmmakers would hire, give, throw a fee his way. Would you read our script? We just want that Billy Wilder opinion, you know. And um, and then when he started giving too many negative opinions, they stopped doing that. Right. <laughs> but um, I could see it could be something along those lines that would make some some sort of sense. And also looking at the the creative team behind this. There were a couple things that I, I noticed looking at Elliot Kastner. First of all, is that you have a you do have a connection to him, in that he is the stepfather to Carrie Elways, who plays Thomas Ince in Cats. Oh, I did. Oh my! Realize that. Wow. Okay. So you probably have access to more Elliot Kastner yeah. knowledge. Yeah. You know, and now that you're saying it, it, it may be suddenly coming back to me because I got I did get close with with Carrie. Um, during the shoot, uh, we were out of touch for a while and actually just got back in touch in early 2020. And I was, we were kind of coordinating plans and then it got canceled because it, it was something medical with his wife. And, but it was right at the beginning of 2020 and then COVID hit. So we're due to get uh, back in touch and re reschedule our over a year uh, uh, thing. But yes, right, I, I, that, that is starting to, uh, I'm starting to remember that connection. But I just love, I mean, his filmography I mean, and, and his his moxie. And, the, and I just love the producers who got films made rather than have films land in their lap. Yep. You know, and he's just, and, and I just, I, I, at his best, I love his, uh, you know, I love uh, his taste. You know, I have, I have, a, I have a 16 millimeter projector and a, and a small uh, a library of films and have people over and screen films you know i have i have one of his films which which is actually i'm about to screen next week because because it stars the uh the late great um charles groden which is um uh 13 um i mean 11 harrow house which is a fun heist film with him and candace bergen and james mason mm. trevor Howell. um so i mean i just, yeah I, mean, I just think is 
I like the the the, the material he he leaned towards. I mean, whether it's Harper or uh, where obviously where Eagles Dare was a huge hit for him. I also revisited that recently just on my own. Um, I think, you know, I, I always thought he was British, but apparently, you know, because he did so much over there. Um, I think he was not British, actually. I think he was from here. I mean, he worked with Morris Agency in L.A. And um, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I think he re ultimately settled in England. He worked enough there. But I mean, every I mean, the long goodbye. I, these are these are some uh, the Burton film villain is a solid, solid. Oh, yeah. Crime picture. Um, again, that's another film that was trashed because people critics just love to trash villain. They lump, lump it all together with some other not very good uh, Burton films. But a lot of those films are we're realizing they are actually good. And he's actually very good in it, um, playing this working class and volatile um, and gay uh, criminal. Um, so it's it's a it's a power powerful film. Power Break Hard Pass is another great one mm -hmm. that he did just before this. Um, you Have know, you ever seen uh, the Bobo? I've not seen the Bobo. It is one of my favorite Peter Sellers comedies. It, it's 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 slight but so mm -hmm. good, and it, it's it's mm -hmm. one of the ones. It was on the original list for World Is Wrong subject matter, and we will probably be getting to that at some point. There's Great. one thing, uh, a story I heard on, I believe it's on the the films that the or the movies that made me podcast with Joe Dante, and he tells mm -hmm. a story again. I think this is him telling the story that Elliot Kastner hated the long goodbye. Mm -hmm. And that that led him to make the all the Robert Mitchum, Raymond Chandler right. films, because he was like, no, <laughs> this is how you do Raymond Chandler, right. which is funny because I feel like all of the Thomas McGuane stuff that he was making at the time was doing this, the exact same kind of subversion to the Western. Mm -hmm. And so it, yeah. as I'm looking at this, there's this weird thing like, OK, so you really are precious about noir but as far as the Western, yeah, let's make it as ramshackle. <laughs> let's, let's let's throw Sam Waterson and Jeff Bridges into it and make Rancho Deluxe. And <laughs> right, well, yeah, I mean, in a, in a way, it's you know, again, that's something where you have your again, you it's it you can't distance yourself uh, when, when you're someone like Kastner from the process of having made it, and so you you sit there, you were excited to do this, you brought Altman in, and now he's suddenly being subversive. And it wasn't your idea. Um, right. And and so the, the film, you know, and, and, and a lot of filmmakers and a lot of, you know, not every critic was on board with what The Long Goodbye was. And, not, not, and audiences weren't necessarily on board. The, the film is, I think, I don't think anyone I know now who doesn't think um, it's an excellent film. Uh, and it was, it was, you know, we had seen quite enough Private Eye movies. We didn't need another. I mean, we do. I mean, there's nothing wrong with Private Eye films, but I, I just think. But I saw it recently. I saw it, and I think in in uh, in 2019 with an audience, a packed audience at the Egyptian Theater here in Los Angeles, and uh, with Gould there, the film goes over great. It, it looks great on. Um, uh, um, it's so well written. Um, every actor is is right on the money in it. And I'll tell you what's interesting about Kastner in that regard is he makes this this pair of of um, Chandler. Um, Philip Marlowe movies. I just want to see the same director before I make my comment about them. Uh, one is you got so this one was. Why can't I find the director? Uh, come on, make it easier for me, will you please? Uh, well, Michael, I think did Winter direct both The Big Sleep and Farewell, My Lovely? Let me see. Did he direct Farewell, My Lovely? Um, because yeah, uh, because with those, no, Dick Richards uh, directed Farewell, My Lovely which is really good and period um uh period in a way that you know like chinatown is and then they do the big sleep which updates it to contemporary london and it's bad <laughs> it's just not a good picture so in a weird way he went and did something revisionist in the bad way whereas and uh, whereas um <laughs> Uh, Altman did it in the right way. You don't just put, uh, you just don't shove them in in England um, in, in in modern suits, which look too expensive, 
uh, and just think it's going to work. Uh, it just doesn't. And, and so they're, they're often released as double feature Blu-rays or double feature DVDs. And you're like, just watch Farewell, My Lovely, because the big sleep um, uh, is is not. Well, I still haven't met anybody who likes the big sleep, the, the remake of the big. But like I said, Farewell, My Lovely is pretty solid. Good advice. And Kastner, and Kastner did both. Good advice. Okay, well, let's. We've done a lot of of preamble. We have, and we've we've talked about the film a little bit, but we, I want to get into it. There's one thing I wanted to point out as far as this film not being successful in its time. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just. I I went and looked at the movies that were released in May of 1976. Now, earlier in the year, we got. All the President's Men and Family Plot and Stay Hungry, all really, really good films. But the month this came out, there was nothing. Baby mm. Blue Marine, Escape from the Dark, The Premonition. Oh, uh, sorry, not nothing. 1900 did come out in May of that year, mm -hmm. but not a film that got a lot of love in its time. Mother Jugs and Speed was probably the biggest other like popular film that came out in May of 1976. So it's not like the Missouri breaks had a lot of competition at the box office. It's not until like June that we get Harry and Walter go to New York, the tenant silent movie Logan's mm -hmm. run. And I remember, I mean, I'm, I'm just old enough that I remember this year as a film goer. The Omen mm -hmm. was very scary. Outlaw jo Josie Wales comes in June. So yep, maybe you can yep. see Outlaw Josie Wales taking some of the thunder from this film. But what, I, did, what oh, did come out earlier in the year? Um, so like I said, Stay Hungry, All the President's Men in April, Duchess mm -hmm. and the Dirtwater Fox and Lipstick. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, trying to, I'm just looking at Robin and Marion in March. Mm -hmm. uh, taxi driver people, in February. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. And that's I think about people it. Going, I feel like people weren't going to the movies very much because what you have, you have Jaws being held over in theaters for a year, mm. you know, <laughs> at that point. Uh, when did uh, Rocky come out? Uh, I bet it's closer to award season. Wouldn't you guess? Cause it, uh, that's so part of what leads to them. So the front is September. Let's see. The shootest is August. I remember going to the to that when it came out. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I don't know if they knew Rocky was an award movie. Uh, December. Yeah, well, you're right. December third, seventy six. It came out. Um, so it did come out. They must have thought they had a hit on their hands. Um, but it certainly speaks to the zeitgeist, which is. You know, Rocky winning Best Picture over Network sort of precedes this realization that Jaws was um, a, a film of its time and place. Audiences were were tiring of uh, thoughtful, cautionary cynicism or downbeat or uh, depictions on the screen of too much reality of the human condition. And you get Rocky and it's ultimately, you know, cheering, you know, people on their feet in the audience cheering. It kind of prefigures that the next big hit will be similarly be a film that gets people on their feet, happy to leave the happy when they leave the theater. And so, and Arthur Penn, the cinema of Arthur Penn is not that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, uh, and, and so or of a lot of the great uh, 70s filmmakers. So I feel like. Is it even possible that 76 was not a great year in general for audiences and box office it, it, it is entirely possible too. Um, you know, still trying to chase the dream that was Jaws, you know. Um, uh, well, you know, they hired the, the guy who did the music for Jaws for this. So mm -hmm. that's... Yeah, that's another thing that to talk about is, is as the score was, as I was watching the movie before the credit came on, I was like, I wonder who's doing the score. This is, uh, is this Goldsmith? Because it feels you know, Goldsmith mm -hmm. is, is yeah. such an amazing chameleon and experimenter at the same time. I just think there's no one better. Uh, and then we forget because we all get lost in the in the bombast of the Lucas scores and the Spielberg scores. We forget. You, you go, oh, you hear a score like this, or his jazz score for Catch Me If You Can, or his horror movie score for the 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 Fury, or or Dracula. 
and you realize, you know, you realize that he too was quite a um, uh, quite a chameleon, and 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 quite inspired by other styles. Um, it's really a wonderful score, uh, John Williams' score for the Missouri Breaks. I mean, it's got kind of an incredible pedigree. This movie, it it does. There are times when. And I think the score might be part of this, that it gives me like these Butch Cassidy and the Sundance kind of feelings. Like the film sure. is existing in the wake of Butch and Sundance and it kind of wants us to feel Butch and Sundance feelings, especially with the the sort of whether it's the 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 train robbery and the and Nicholson's interaction with the guy in the in the train and the sort of the goofiness of that and even including money flying through the air and the riding around on the horse with Kathleen uh, Catherine Kathleen Lloyd and that that has a feeling of Butch and Catherine Ross on the bicycle and then just sort of the hijinks music and I'm I wonder if some something about that like there's something very light and playful about certain elements of it. And the film doesn't, isn't really a light or playful movie. Did those changes in tones strike you? Well, it's, it's, it struck me definitely. Um, but not in a, in a bad way. I, I, you know, I, I get it when people say, well, that this, this film has to make up its mind what it's trying to be. And I've found that in reading people's scripts and so forth. Um, but again, in, in expert hands, uh, tonal shifts, you know, John De Jonathan Demme was very good with that. When you think of a movie like Something Wild, tonal shifts sometimes are, are what um, keep a, keep you on your toes, especially a film like this, where there's the threat of violence around the, literally around the corner. Um, so I, I, I enjoyed it. It also, it also says, look, we're making this movie for an audience. They need to be entertained. Yeah, and that you know that 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 train robbery scene and him going to kind of leap off the train with the cash and then realizing oh can't quite leap off a train when you're on a suspension bridge uh, is a funny moment. <laughs> you know? uh, so uh, I think it's I think it's a needed moment in terms of the rhythms of of life for these guys. You know, it wasn't all one thing. It isn't all just a dour, dirty, muddy western. Uh, it's, uh, sometimes it's dour, dirty, muddy Western. Sometimes there's, there's the comedy of life. Uh, you know, our, George, George Roy Hill did a great job with that, with the world according to Garp, mm -hmm. you know, you, get, you know, put across what life is like in one movie, uh, the, all the highs and all the lows. And yet it all makes great, elegant sense, um, in that film. Yeah. You know, at his best, I think Arthur Penn was able to do that as well. So, Let's let's just walk through some of what you consider to be like the highlights for you about this film. Uh, I'll I'll just I'll start by saying just the opening. So we have this uh, the the cattleman who's riding with these two with these two other cowboys, and you there's a, a really friendly dialogue going on with him and this guy who we find out in just a minute he's about to hang, and mm -hmm. it's. Uh, it's wonderfully disconcerting, mm -hmm. and I feel like that kind of goes through the whole film. These very, even though it takes place in another time, all of the conversations feel so casual and real. Mm -hmm. And I think that's you know, like I said, that's the that's a testament to everyone involved: the director, the actors, the writer, and the the editors. Um, do you have any scenes that that you feel like really need noting? Oh, I mean, I just think the film. Yeah, I think the film comes alive there. I love that scene um, that where we meet Nicholson uh, and and all the guys are working together, and it's 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 shot, you know, lit only by uh, the sun, or at least a pair uh, gives the appearance of only being uh, shot uh, from the lit, lit through the slats in the wood and you start to realizing how people actually lived um, and had to, you know, there, with, without electricity in, in a lot of cases, uh, especially in, in the more rural areas. Um, I just think that's a beautiful, and, and also it's a great scene in terms of Nicholson, in terms of guys interacting with each other, um, what emotional toolkit they have to express grief and sorrow because they're, they're talking about, 
that that one that that obviously someone who was close to Nicholson uh, is now dead, um, and Nicholson you could, he, his character wants to cry, but he's not going to cry in front of these guys, you know. Uh, and so it, I think it's a very you know strong scene right there. Uh, and as the film goes on, I love I love Brando's entrance. I got to say, I think I I, I I think I like every single. St- I don't think there's a misstep. And, and every time he was on screen, I like the choice ways that they bring um, Brando and Nicholson together. Uh, again, Nicholson apparently was pissed off about that scene, the scene where he's uh, planting, where he's on the farm and Brando shows up and starts showing off his gun and shooting the cabbage. Apparently it's not as written, um, but as acted and as cut together, whatever way he did, whatever way he felt Brando was being unpredictable comes across as his character so good is, that scene is so good yeah, yeah uh the bathtub scene apparently nicholson was was never happy with even as written he still couldn't believe that uh his character wouldn't uh take advantage and kill this guy in that moment you know as as written about you know they talk and it was brando's choice to turn his back to him and make himself so vulnerable in a way that um in a way that he knew the psychology of the man wouldn't kill another man that way. That to just kill a man who's now turned his back on you naked in a in a in a in a bubble bath. But what's great about that moment too, I don't know if you felt this feeling, especially when the camera, no matter where the camera was, either behind Brando or in front of him, I kept thinking, does he have a gun just off camera? He's about mm-hmm. to pull up. I, I it's been so long since I thought saw the film, I had forgotten what came next. And so, um, so yeah, it's a strong scene, but, but, but Nicholson didn't like, didn't feel like he made it work, nor did he feel con- committed that the script had made it work, that he, he understood intellectually why the guy didn't want, didn't choose to kill Brando, uh, his enemy in that moment. Um, but he didn't, he didn't believe it. And it goes it. back to the very first time they meet and... Nicholson is sort of chiding Brando's character for, as being a coward who shoots people without looking them in the eye. Mm-hmm. Yes. And, and that yeah. comes back over and over and over again in their interactions. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's again, Absolutely. that thing I'm saying is like, is Brando steals every scene, but he hands the movie to Nicholson. It's yeah. the fact that Nicholson didn't like it. It almost speaks more to Brando's genius that mm-hmm. he was giving, you're giving someone a gift and they don't even know that you're giving them the gift. Yeah, 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 <laughs> absolutely. No, you, I think you, 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 uh, you hit it on the head there. I wanted to see what else Michael Butler, because um, it's a Bill Butler, but I don't know what Michael Butler, uh, what else he shot. And he's, he doesn't have a ton of cinematography credits, but I mean, what his first film as, as cinematographer is a great Don Siegel film, Charlie Varick. Oh yeah! Um, wow. You know, and then from from there, it's the it, it, he doesn't have any. He has w- films we all know in his credits, but not necessarily classics. You know, he did ninety two in the Shade and Harry and Tonto, but after that, you know, Telephone, Jaws two, Wanda Nevada, Smoking the Bandit two, Cannonball Run. So he was he was taking the gigs. Um, but I think I think Missouri Breaks proves he was, you know, I, I think he had a lot more in him than he was um, than he was given to do. And I'm wondering, according to the, it looks like he just retired because according to IMDb, he's not deceased. So but his last film he shot was uh, looks like 83 and then he didn't do anything again until 98. Someone must have pulled him out of retirement. Um to do a film. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. Uh, so I don't quite know what happened to him, but um, but he does a good job on on this film for sure. And, and I think Arthur Arthur Penn is no slouch in terms of knowing what he wants uh, and and working with his keys, of course, because uh, we've all seen movies where oh, this is a great cinematographer. Let me see another film and it looks terrible and realize, oh, OK, well, it's you know, they really work in concert with their director. They didn't just like just turn them on and they'll shoot everything perfectly. Uh, so. It's quite st- a stunning crew, but as far as other scenes, I mean, like I said, I think I think the the the, the guys who are uh, the, this cast, who they got together to be oh, uh, yeah. his crew, 
Um, once I were, was reminded when I watched the film, oh, I'm in such good hands. They've got Frederick Forrest, Randy Quaid, Harry Dean Stanton, and John Ryan, John P. Ryan. I mean, I'll, I could just keep watching yeah. scenes with these guys all, all together. Um, I could, you know, the film doesn't feel overlong to me at all. I did pause and realize, oh, Brandon doesn't come in until like the 36 minute mark. But at another moment, I paused and the movie was almost over. It's like, wow, this to me, this movie's flying by. Um, this is not a movie that felt um, slow or inflated at all. Uh, and I just love that third act. A couple of reviewers missed the mark and said, oh, and just it starts off well, but then just falls apart by the end. I just think Brando picking off these people mm -hmm. uh, and, and then when he was with them, it, such tension when he was with Randy Quaid, such tension when he was with Harry Dean Stanton, because you know what he's planning. And just wondering when it's going to come. You know what that um, really reminded me of when I was watching it? I just felt like I felt so much like Alan Rickman in Die Hard mm -hmm. in the scene where he puts on the voice and is yeah. hanging out with Bruce Willis pretending to be someone else. The whole time in that scene with Quaid, I'm looking, oh, Rickman was doing Brando in the Missouri Breaks. <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. Yeah, I love those. I love the scenes with there's just a couple of really maybe two or three really great just one-on-one -on -one scenes with harry dean stanton and nicholson mm -hmm, and yes, they're so yeah. low-key well one of the like a couple of them they're they're low-key but shot through with so much those are I, I think all the like the scenes with nicholson and brando are the ones that really stand out but those scenes are really if you, for people who love going back and looking at great 70s acting I don't. I've never hear people talk about Harry Dean Stanton in this film, and he's great. Yeah, he really is. Apparently, it was originally going to be, I think, Harry Dean Stanton and Warren Oates. I think uh, I forget who they which said. Role. Actually, Thomas McGuane yeah. was saying that Warren Oates uh, used to come and visit. Like he would, was hanging out on the set. Like he came mm -hmm. to visit. Um, so, yeah, I don't know why yeah, they didn't squeeze him into that movie. He. It'd be great. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, this, like I said, this is Kastner just uh, kind of saying, let me make this movie happen. And this is not something, you know, we all get everything is auteurist theory, auteurist theory. But sometimes movies are put together uh, by their producers. You know, as much as we all call Joel and Ethan Cohen auteurists, a lot of the projects, you know, Scott Rudin, you know, brought them up, brings them No Country to Old Men, you know, No Country for Old Men and says, I think this is a movie. And uh, and, you know, they say no before they say yes. And then suddenly it's a Coen Brothers movie. So, you know, it, every every great director or, 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 or tourist doesn't start by conceiving of the, the, the project. Often it's brought to them, you know, uh, and this one, this one, he put this whole thing together. It wasn't that uh, let me get Arthur Penn on and let's let me start working on casting with Arthur Penn. Uh, uh, it was something that he started to put together all these pieces, you know, and brilliantly, I think, I think in terms of the longevity of the film, because that's all that really matters. Uh, I mean, not, not necessarily to the financiers, but in terms of art history, all that matters is the longevity. So it's uh, it's a film that's that's quite strong and a, quite a testament to everybody involved that they all were involved, um, you know, because for Harry Dean Stanton, it's ultimately a demotion. To, to have this role versus what was originally talked about for him in, in this film, uh, which was a bigger one of the one of the two leads. But he does it, like you said, he is he is he is terrific. Freddie Forrest is terrific. Um, John Ryan is doing something real specific in this mm -hmm. part. That's a lot of fun to watch. Kind of goofy. He's like, yeah, he's well, he's the toughest. He's like the the most volatile because he's got that John Ryan voice. He's the most volatile and uh, of of this little group. But he's all, he's also the one that does the sewing and he'll do the the knitting and the repairs for you. So there's a he doesn't quite look you in the eye unless he's angry. Um, everybody here is just such such a great collection of interesting actors. So um, were you suggested? So was Harry Dean Stanton? He was originally going to play the Nicholson role. I, I I feel like that's what I read somewhere that that was the, the uh, that and that yeah Oates was going to be the. Um, the Brando part. I'm I'm pretty sure that's what I read. Forgive me if forgive me if the history does not bear out. But I know it was two other actors, and I could swear Harry Dean Stanton was listed as one of them. Huh. Um, play those parts. And can we talk a little bit? I I know, like you said, Kathleen Lloyd was not served career wise by this film, but 
I think her scenes with Nicholson, particularly, there's two in two that really jump out. The one where they first where they go on that first horse ride, and she is sort of talking tough and trying to seduce him in a way that that is sort of supposed to intimidate him, and then he gives it back to her, and they're just that that back and forth. I think is really great, and Nicholson is is phenomenal in that. But then. The scene where he seduces her with, well, she kind of seduces him, really, but uh, where he's just being, he takes to the land, the, the stuff with Nicholson taking to the land and taking care of that garden and showing how he irrigates it and how he's going to yep. make her Chinese tea. There's something yep. that is so, I don't know, I just, so rich. It's It's sexy in a way that is not that doesn't do any of the things that you think of as like, Oh, well, this is a sexy scene, but those I scenes agree. have are yeah. just electric. Well, yeah. And, and you have to give her credit because she is in the inenviable position of, of making sure that when we watch her scenes with Nicholson, that we're that the audience is not going, Oh, all right, we'll end already. Cause I want to get back to the Brando stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. And so she, she is uh she i think the film the scenes are well written uh uh directed and acted I, I and we'll go back to i just do want to jump over but again what i'm reading here in the nicholson biography is that mcguane scripted it as a lark to star warren oates and harry dean stanton intending to direct the film himself uh the three were friends uh so that's that's where it began and then then his uh, and and that he was that McGuane himself was sort of busy finishing 92 in the shade as they were working on this film, as they were working on Missouri breaks. So he was, the, the films overlapped schedules a little bit. Uh, so he kind of had one eye on it and one eye uh, not on it throughout the process. So yeah, it would have been those, that, that was the original. And, and uh, I believe that was, I, I, I'm not, I'm not sure who was going to play who, uh, I think it's written which one it seems I, I think I thought Oates was supposed to play the baddie but I could be but maybe not I could, uh, I, I feel like may, Harry Dean Stanton if I was if I was if I was positioned with those two I think I would think Harry Dean Stanton mm -hmm. to play the scary guy from out of town who's here to kill me and Warren Oates is kind of more the leading man yeah type. so I think that would make more sense yeah I could see that but I could be wrong Warren Oates is also scary and volatile uh, and charismatic and you always want that charismatic villain so maybe that slow talking um direct slim harry dean stanton was better for what might have actually played better for the nicholson part so i'm not quite sure which I, i'm I'm, get, I'm actually thinking that was what i've read is that stanton in the nicholson part and warren oates as the uh what's the term they keep using for him not prospect regulator Re 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 regulator regulator oh, regulator that. isn't that another yeah. word for a dry gulcher not yeah. the kindest word. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, it's pretty solid. And, and I love seeing Randy Quaid from anything in the 70s. Oh, He's yeah. so good to forget who he is now. That's that's a, that's a sign of really a great actor who can make you totally forget how uh, nut job crazy they are uh, uh, today and politically and otherwise. Uh, he's just all these performances hold up so beautifully, you know. One thing when I was listening uh, to... Uh, this interview with Thomas McGuane, someone was pointing out, you know, it, all of your books talk about irrigation. You're just, you're not, you always talk about irrigation in all of your books. And I, I love that uh, one of Nichol the Nicholson seduction scene involves <laughs> irrigating his, uh, his garden. Uh, I'm just kind of curious as you, as a writer, do you have anything that's like that where you're someone who watches or reads all your stuff might notice some, I don't know, particular obsession of yours? Uh, that's a, that's a good question. I, I don't know that I can point to something as specific as that. I certainly can't, at the, it, 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 as the question is asked, I can certainly point to that, um, that I find that there's, that there's no avoiding uh, humor in my work, even when I'm quote unquote writing a drama, I've seen Cats Meow on the comedy shelf. I've seen it on the drama shelf at, at video stores. Um, and so I, I feel that there's a voice there 
because I can't because I, I, I just don't believe drama means life with the humor cut out. Uh, so I feel like there's always organic. And I also find a, a characters who have wit uh, and, and humorous observations fit any genre. Uh, but no, I don't feel I don't notice it. And, in a, you know, uh, I'm sure if I look, I might find it. You know, interestingly, there's and I'm paraphrasing, but but there's, you know, there's a theory and I, Billy Wilder espoused once that once you found out what a Billy Wilder was, but Billy Wilder movie was, he couldn't make them anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's something about uh, that once you start to go too deep into it and then realizing now I have to live up to what I just said my movies are by taking am I making them canned as Orson Welles said as a, is, a, is there something not fresh anymore about it uh, so a long way of saying no I don't think I can think of something <laughs> well we'll leave, we'll leave that to to the critics and to to your to your fans so before we let you go is there anything you, I mean where can people find your work what are you up to what what can we promote um we can promote uh you know I, I did segue to directing I always wanted to direct and have been directing since my student films a uh, film I'm very proud of a film that I um, my directorial debut uh, uh, footprints which uh, played in six cities in 2011 is on Fandor and also on Voodoo, I think, with commercials. Um, it's a film that uh, got great reviews in San Francisco. The Chronicle, uh, chairman of the New York Film Critics, called it one of the 10 best films uh, uh, at his half year mark review, uh, So, which actually helped us open in more cities than just New York and L.A. So it's a film that's out there. I'm proud of it's out there. I'm also segued into graphic novels. I have... Um, film that was just uh, nominated for a Rondo Award. I mean, a, 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 a graphic novel called Stoker and Wells about a fictitious, uh, it's the first of a trilogy, uh, about a fictitious pairing of a 20-something uh, uh, screw-up named H.G. Uh, Wells and a 40-something uh, curmudgeonly theater owner named um, Bram Stoker, which is who they were at that time, um, mm. meeting and going on an adventure that winds up leading to the, the, the folks, both men's first great work, which is The Time Machine and Dracula. And I'm working now uh, with uh, produ- producers and we are packaging it to bring it to, to TV. I'm actually, um, I've been meeting with uh, showrunners on it. Uh, so I think mean, that could be something that people will see on uh, Netflix or Amazon within the next uh, within the next uh, year to two because it's a fairly big production. Also working on a uh, on a limited series about Rita Hayworth, um, about a six part uh, limited series about the life of uh, Margarita Carmen Cancino, better known as Rita Hayworth. So um, dude, there's a lot I've been working on. I'm I'm on Facebook, uh, Stephen Peros. I'm, I'm the I'm the Stephen Peros who's not a realtor from the <laughs> Northeast. <laughs> There aren't many Stephen Peros, uh, so I encourage you to friend me on Facebook, uh, Stephen G. Peros on Twitter. Um, and I think that that uh, covers the... And I've also got another graphic novel. I'm uh, A good friend of mine created a character in the 90s called Shi, S-H-I, which is the kanji for death in Japan. He's relaunched his uh, Amerasian, um, uh, haunted Amerasian uh, female hero, uh, uh, and, and aged her age appropriately. So she's in her forties now. Uh, and he asked me what I write it. And I did, we, we spitballed the, we, we, we brought, you know, we, we uh, spitballed the story together and then I wrote the books and they're going over really, really well with um, fans and critics alike. So, um, so those are available. Uh, she, uh, the, my book Stoker and Wells is on Amazon as well as Indiegogo. Uh, so yeah, I'm out there in, in film in, in graphic novels, film, theater, there's a lot. To, uh, if you like Christmas, I did a film that's on every year. And also you can watch a film I'm actually proud of. I didn't write it as a Christmas movie. It's a film I wrote as a theatrical film that Lifetime became aware of and we wound up doing. Called It was it was titled as, to be a Christmas movie called A Country, Country Christmas Story. But anybody who writes about it says, wow, this is so much better than the average cable Christmas movie. So I'm proud of that film. Dolly Parton's in it. Mm. Uh, so... Um, yeah, it doesn't follow the halt these these formulas that you see in Christmas movies. It's a, it's a it's a film that was conceived as an independent film and and then eventually found a home uh, uh, there, uh, directed by Eric Bross, who's uh, directed Ten Benny with Adrian Brody and a lot of really good films. He's won DGA Award. It's um, a, a picture I'm proud of. But yeah, there's there's a lot of which film with Adrian Brody. 
He directed a film called Ten Benny and Restaurant, oh. some of Adrian Brody's early stuff. Which, Got it. Which were I thought really you said solid. Dummy. That's why I, I, yeah. I know yeah. that film. Uh, I know the producer of Dummy, yes. <laughs> this has been so much fun, and I I hope that this is the first. I, you know, you, you mentioned several films you'd like to cover. I'd love to have you back in, at some point in the future to do this again. It, this has just been a total joy. So terrific. I, I would... Same here. Same here. Thank you. Uh, it's been a pleasure. I think what you guys are doing is great with this show. Uh, I enjoyed uh, I enjoyed listening to it about the cat's meow. And uh, hopefully people will enjoy this about uh, Missouri Breaks, a film that is very available, accessible. Uh, it's on Tubi. Um, if you if you don't want to pay to see it, a nice HD print of it is on uh, your Tubi app. With commercials, but only, I think every 20 minutes or so, they're pretty good on Tubi about not having too many commercials. Uh, so it's there if you want to see it. It's also readily available on, on DVD and Blu-ray. So I, I highly, highly recommend people check it out. Dear listener, if you are just discovering our podcast, you can find all of our episodes on our website at theworldiswrongpodcast.com. You can also write to us at contact at the world is wrong podcast.com or follow us on Instagram at the world is wrong podcast. And now back to the show. Do you call yourself a music fan? Are you the one making the playlist for all the parties? Then you've got to listen to the pinch music podcast where we interview musicians, engineers, producers, and music lovers of all types. We even put together playlists for any and all occasions. So if you want to have the Beatles vs. Stones debate, pick up some engineering tips, or just discover a new artist, you got to check out the Pinch Music Podcast, all a part of the Paperhouse Network. Hi, I'm Brian. And I'm AJ. And we have a podcast called The Director's Wall examining a filmmaker's career, film by film. First up was M. Night Shyamalan, then Francis Ford Coppola. Who's next? Is there anything to this whole auteur theory? Find out on The Director's Wall. Subscribe by Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or your preferred listening platform. Great episode. Good job. Well, thank you. Thank you. We, you were you were missed. I don't know why you don't come on to these, these interviews. The, you, I feel like it's missing out with you not being there. You know, I'm just busy in a hot tub, just like relaxing. Sleazy bastard. <laughs> no, but so that was great. Um, we should have him back for sure, maybe next year. Like we don't want to too soon. We want well, to enjoy this. But uh, actually, I, back. I should. We should say that I did record a short interview with him about the cat's meow and we will be releasing that Ooh. as a bonus episode nice. in the coming year so keep your ears peeled and your eyes open <laughs> and your cat's meow and uh, <laughs> for that episode so since you did uh two with him did you uh try to get him to do a radio eight ball do a musical divination with him at all you know Which is your other show that you do radio eight ball show where you Pick where you ask a question and then you pick songs at random to answer that question. You know, I should have, I should have because uh, I've st actually started doing. Well, I think I'm going to do that more. I didn't really think of it with Stephen, and if he's listening to this, to this and thinking, why didn't? What isn't a musical divination, and why didn't I get to do that? <laughs> I'll say, remember you had a you had a time limit, and I I didn't want to waste time <laughs> with my synchronicities that could take an, an hour just on their own. Um, but I recently recorded an interview with Paul Williams, the director of the November men who, if you'll Ooh. remember in our November men episode, we ended it sort of with this call to the universe. We kind of do this with a lot of our episodes where we think of a guest we'd like to have, and then we have no idea how to find them. And then the episode comes out and eventually at least in this case, he reached out to me from the jungles of Brazil, literally. And wow. And then we conducted a very long interview about the November men, about his films. He sent me his memoir, which is amazing. <laughs> and we talk about <laughs> that. And that'll that'll also be coming out at a future date. But we started that off with a musical divination and it was 
really powerful. It was pretty amazing. Wow. So uh, so is this going to be episode 667? I think it will probably be... It's definitely a crossover episode, and I'm trying to figure out how to fit it into the Radio 8 Ball release schedule, but it's very likely that our episode sometime in the future will also be episode 667 of the Radio 8 wow. Ball show. And, I love the old crossover. Uh, I like that. Uh, yeah, cross-pollination is great. You know, it's it's we're doing a lot of that. We actually <laughs> we also just recorded uh, an episode. Maybe it'll be out by now. A bonus episode of the Pure Cinema podcast with those guys where we yeah. talked about their yeah. show and our show and the love of films and how we're all wrong about films and write about <laughs> them. And it was wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of all of that. Let's get to the director's wall. You're the podcast that you host oh. with AJ Gonzalez, who has been, become, uh, like Stephen, uh, a featured guest on The World is Wrong. And where are you at in your excavation of the, the Coppola mines? <laughs> well, what's fu- funny enough, we just did something that also has Herodine Stanton and John P. Ryan in it. We did the fairy tale theater episode he directed for that Shelley Duvall show where he did a version of Rip Van Winkle and it's narrated by John P. Ryan who also plays a ghost and Harry Dean Stanton plays Rip Van Winkle and there's just not enough John P. Ryan in the world I'm a big fan of his I think he's great and so that's I think it's cool that that episode will probably definitely be out around the same time this is out in the next week or two um so like that's uh exciting that's really cool because actually I just listened to an episode of the movies that made me podcast uh, the Joe Dante and Josh Olson movie podcast and they had an actor on named Clayne Crawford and he was talking about how when he first came to Hollywood he grew up in a little town that just didn't have access to older films he just knew the new stuff so when he came to Hollywood and got into acting class, someone told him he needed to see five easy pieces and he went to see five easy pieces. And then the next day he was out at a, uh, like a diner in LA and John P Ryan, P Ryan was just sitting there and he went up to him and said, Hey, you were great in five easy pieces. And this is when you're a kid and you go up to older, older actors, you kind of have this weird little bubble of like, they look at you for a second and are like, are you creepy? No, no, you're just an <laughs> idiot. Okay. And he, but then he told them this whole story, told this whole story about how basically John P. Ryan took him under his wing, brought, basically brought him back to his place and gave him, gave him a box of videotapes. He had been a member of the Academy for like 30 years. So he had videotapes of everything that was an Oscar considered like considered for an Oscar and all that time. And he just gave him tapes and tapes and tapes and basically became a teacher to this kid, which wow, is that's just very cool. I was just, I mean, it's funny cause I, I, John P. Ryan's great, but I don't think of him. I've been thinking yeah. of him more in the last two or three weeks than I have in yeah. the last two or three decades. <laughs> So <laughs> better late than never. It's good. To, it's wrong. a good time. Can you say? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a good time yeah. to think of John Ryan. Um, so, uh, so, uh, so yeah. So, but on the director's wall, you were looking at what was you were looking at the f- fairy tale theater episode of Rip Van Winkle that Coppola directed with Stanton and John P. Ryan. Very wow. interesting. Very weird. What else yeah. were you covering on this episode? Uh, we were doing all like the little bits and pieces. We also did Captain EO and a Saturday Night Live episode that Coppola, quote unquote, directed. And he's in it as the character of the director. So that's, li- please listen to that little odds and ends episode. It'll be it's very good. And w- can you tell us anything about that, that SNL episode or do we just have to wait to the... <laughs> listen to the th- episode, but it's definitely, it's during that weird year when it was oh wait randy quaid <laughs> randy quaid again <laughs> in missouri break so yeah randy quaid was on it with robert downey jr and joan cusack a very strange year for night for saturday night live is it the... an episode where ba- oh go on it's the one where coppola is like pretending to direct it and he'll like in the middle of weekend update be like cut 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 i didn't believe it do it again and it's sort of him just playing up this idea of this sort of obsessive director it's very high concept. It's very good. Is there a joke in that episode? There's where uh, Robert Downey Jr. is 
doing a review of Cats, the musical? No, but <laughs> I want to see that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I remember that as being like my favorite thing from that season. Anyway, I don't know if this is going to be your favorite thing from this season. Uh, that would be kind of a that would be kind of a shitty way to 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 talk in front of Brian, who wasn't really a part of it as much as he is of other episodes. So <laughs> let's just say that this has been a very very special episode of The World Is Wrong. Very special. But uh, I like the ones where where we talk mostly, Brian. Those are those are my favorites. <laughs> well, next week or next episode, we're doing. A movie that I brought, Michael Bay's The Island. Mm. So we're finally getting it because Michael Bay is a much not liked filmmaker slash person. And so I think this is an interesting movie. As if you've avoided him at all costs, this is an interesting in. And it's a movie that even he is wrong about. And we can, we'll can we go into that uh, when we do the episode. So I'm excited. Are you saying, are you saying that we might be on an Island in our celebration of the Island? <laughs> that may be true. Uh, well, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to exploring that film with you. And, uh, if you like what we're doing here on the world is wrong podcast, please contact us at contact at the world is wrong podcast you can find our website with all of our episodes at www.theworldiswrongpodcast if you want to communicate with us through social media we only have one kind of account at this point it is the instagram account we show lots of we put lots of clips up there that's at the world is wrong podcast and we also have a youtube channel and it's funny i think we get more views and listens on YouTube than anything else. I don't think we have any episodes yet that have like over 2000 downloads, but we have huh. several episodes on YouTube that have over 2000 views. So, wow. Uh, so some of you are just enjoying us on YouTube. <laughs> and if that's the case, well, uh, I'm sorry, we're not giving more. We haven't given more love to that up until now, but if you're one of those <laughs> viewers slash listeners, I hope you do not begrudge us for, Having a pretty uh, uninteresting visual, just it's probably just a logo you're looking at, and you're just listening to us. But uh, thanks for doing that. Thanks for doing that. So uh, I guess until our next episode, it, it falls to me once again to give you the I don't know the sad happy news that uh, wherever you are, the world is wrong, and it's most likely wrong about you. I like his place, Cal. Yeah, I get quiet. <laughs> Carrie, don't throw them tools down there like that, please. I spent my first 18 years on one of these goddamn things working for my uncle that raised me. And I worked myself cross-eyed, too. About the only thing I had for distraction was was this dog. And I'd had the dog since it was 10 years old. And uh, he, he shot it for sticking its tongue on a pat of butter. So I stayed one more night. And I killed his seed bull. I rustled every damned horse he had, including a racer that I sold as a cow pony to an Indian rancher, and I took the whole damn remuda. And I come within a hair's breadth to sending his sorry hide to kingdom come. I mean, I was that close to shooting that son of a bitch in the brain pan. Well, I never did have that kind of background. Never had nothing neither. My folks always wanted a place. They was good people, so I always sort of saw it with their eyes, you know. Yeah, I see that. But when you think about it, you wouldn't want to wait in a damn place like this. This episode is brought to you by Voodoo Ranger. It's beer. It's hoppy, trend-setting, innovative, served with a little sarcasm, just like Paperhouse Network. Paperhouse Network is hoppy? Uh, yeah. It's like beer for your ears. Get yourself a Voodoo Ranger!